Hello, welcome to our class in computational science. This is a first class in computational science or maybe a second class in scientific computing. Uh, today's visit here in my office will be fairly simple. We'll just introduce ourselves, introduce what we try to do, and then send you off to work. My name is Ruben Landau. I'm a professor of physics at Oregon State University, and I've been a computational physicist since I was in graduate school. Uh, now, recently, I head the computational physics program for undergraduates here at Oregon State University, and that's a BS degree program and started fairly recently. Behind the camera, who you, you usually won't see very much of, is another computational scientist, uh, Sally Hare. She's coming here right now to say hello. And she's been working f for many years as well in computational science. The Sally acts as our director, our editor, and our producer. Well, hello. And I welcome you also to this class. I will be doing the, uh, the work behind the camera. And uh, I'm excited about this, uh, this opportunity for you to listen to a class uh, from another uh, in, in a totally different venue and uh, be um, evaluating how this works and I will be very interested in your feedback and your comments so as we go along please let us know how it's going and now I will go back to my little place behind the camera I'll be watching you through the class thank you Sal we also should say thanks to Oregon State University who supported this project in various ways to the National Science Foundation who supported this project in a number of ways, particularly support of the books that this project is based on, and to EPICS, the Engaging People in Cyber Infrastructure program, also supported by the National Science Foundation, who got us going. Okay, so, uh, let's move on. And this, I have to sort of apologize on this slide. This is our Department of Shameless Commerce slide. You won't see this too often again. But what is this class about? Well, computational science is really about how to use computers to do science or engineering, how to solve problems with computers. And that's what we try to teach. It's the second course because we assume you know your way around the keyboard, we assume you know a little bit about operating systems, about shells, about running software. We also assume that you've learned someplace in your career, or you'll learn on your own very quickly, how to run compiled languages. This course is predominantly focused, at least when we speak about it here, on using Java. Other compiled languages are okay. We'll talk more about that shortly. So, uh, if you haven't had it already, a first course in scientific computing there's a book, not a bad book, I must admit, out there published a couple of years ago that tries to teach you how to get around the keyboard, how to use compiled languages, how to use symbolic languages, um, and that's published by Princeton University Press. We assume you know that. You can buy it online. Buy one for your parents, even. Okay. This course uh, follows that. And it's a preliminary course in its own right, as we'll see, to a truly... Uh, uh, specific course in computational science, what we often call, often call computational X. X could be physics, which is what we predominantly talk about uh, when we move on anyway. X could be biology, could be finance, it could be genetics, could be anything. Okay? So that's still to come. We won't cover that here. What we will cover are these lectures, and it's all, they're all based on materials from this brand new book, A Survey of Computational S Physics. So it's a new book, just come, came out recently, coming out in 2008, also printed by Princeton University Press, and it has my co-authors who deserve some credit, Manuel Paez and Christian Bordiano. Okay. So those are the subjects. So now we'll move on to slide three. What is slide three about? Take a look at it. How do you use these lectures? Okay, so these are video lectures with PowerPoints. And as always with lectures, one has a choice. You can view them after you read the book, then you read the book, you might just survey the book so you have some idea what's coming. You can use the lectures to give you a good idea what's in the book and then read the book after you've heard the lectures. Or best yet, do both. 
That's what I recommend. In any case, I recommend reading the book, not just our book, but any time you have a book to accompany lectures, because there's usually much more in the book than we can put in the lectures. And there's more details, but the lectures are also a lot less formal. We try to just get the big points across and the concepts. So that's what we try to do in these lectures. As you're seeing me now, presumably, you're looking inside a web browser. These movies can be viewed various ways. We've made it very simple by having a Flash-enabled web browser. Most browsers that you have now are Flash-enabled. So you're seeing me here in this little window as we speak, okay? And that's easy. We've done this for a number of reasons. One of the reasons is these lectures you can view you can listen to, you can take anywhere, you can even podcast them, although then you probably want a smaller version that'll fit on, uh, and you can lo look at them many times. You may not want to look at us many times, but you certainly have that option. What you see here, and presumably it's right below me down here someplace, is a table of contents. So this is what we are covering in each lecture. And you have the option of clicking on this table of contents and jumping any place in the lecture you want. So if you have to come back or take a break or you've heard enough of us for a while, you can stop the lecture. There are controls right below, down here, that let you stop the lecture, start it, pause, start from the beginning, etc. So you have total control. It's free. You can look at it as many times as you want. You can jump around, repeat a section, repeat whatever you want. At some point, you may get tired of my voice. Uh, that's okay. I mean, you, we're trying to teach you something here, but it may not be okay for other people who aren't learning anything. So we strongly recommend that you use headphones when you listen to these, particularly if you listen to them in a laboratory setting. If you need to control the volume, often it's at the bottom of your screen, it's someplace on your computer. This image you're looking at, this web page, which has the movie here, it has PowerPoint slides on the side, it has us talking to you, has other items on it. Each one differs. So what you'll find on the bottom is you'll find links. And this will be links either to our web page, could be a local web page, could be links to what might appear on a CD or a DVD someplace. But if you look at this on the web, these are links to actual programs that accompany the textbook, applets in some cases, color animations, visualizations, other items. And the, all this material can be customized to your local class, so it may vary somewhat. But we encourage you to use it all. <clears throat> if you haven't realized it already, uh, you will soon. What we're trying to do here is give a lecture much like a lecture you'd see in a class. It is not scripted. In other words, we don't know exactly what we're going to say. Even though we've planned it very carefully, we know what items we want to cover, we know what materials to include, what to leave out. But we have found, Sally and I here, when we did surveys and some students, listening to a scripted lecture is kind of boring. It's very much like listening to a news reader on television. They sound great, but they often have no first-hand experience with the material. They often, sometimes anyway, don't know what they're saying, what they're talking about, but it sounds very good. Here, we know what we're talking about. We've done this material. We may make mistakes in our language. We may repeat stuff, but that's what the real world is like. So this is much more realistic. Let's hope it's not nearly as boring as it might be otherwise. Finally, we should say, these slides are accessible to disabled people in various ways. We have, of course, sound. We have vision. Uh, if those of you who need something else need more hands-on approach, we also have LaTeX versions of these slides, which can be read by, a, the, even the equations can be read by a reader. Or if you need the PowerPoint slides themselves for accessibility, just contact us, contact me, my webpage, there's an address, and that should help. One use of these lectures, one we encourage, is to have the students, have you, listen to these lectures, and then have more time to be in the laboratory with your professors, with your instructors. And that's using distance education technology, which is developed by many, many people, using that to decrease the distance between you and your education and your instructors.